Okay, thank you very much, uh, Robin, and thanks to Alt for inviting me to give this talk. Um, well, the semiotics of the logo are complex, as you see, and uh, I'm going to try and say a few words skating over the top of what the technology-enhanced learning phase of the teaching and learning research program is. Um, I realize that for those not initiated into these sets of initials, the uh, complexities may be somewhat obscure. Um, so what is the technology-enhanced learning phase of uh, TLRP? Teaching and Learning Research Program was a program founded in around 2000 uh, with the express mission by government, by the Department for Education and Skills, to try to build a, uh, a cumulativity, an accumulation of research findings and educational research that really could make an impact. And I'll say a few words in a minute about what it is I think that's stopping us having much impact, um, not only in higher education, but in education more generally. I really do think it is the case that a visitor from outer space or a visitor from back in time coming to an open university course or to a, um, what, what's happening in, in industry and in commerce and in finance and so on would find much that they didn't understand. But when they went into the lecture halls of our universities or the classrooms of our schools, I think they'd know exactly what was happening because I don't really think that any fundamental changes have taken place in the last hundred or two years that would be so difficult for them. And the question is, given the extreme power of the technology we now all take for granted, why is that? So what the technology-enhanced learning phase of the teaching and learning research program is, is a set of projects with modest funding. I, I mean, 12 million pounds is a lot of money, but it isn't a lot of money compared to the education budget. Uh, it is scheduled to last from last year to 2012, so almost everything I show you in the next half an hour is more or less new. And the idea is that the program will try to rise above the specificities of the individual projects. So there's a set of projects that are working on their research themes, they're trying to answer research questions. You'll see in a minute that they are research questions both about education and about computer science. But the real issue is, in order to have an impact, can we go further, can the program go further than simply answering the specific research questions of the individual projects? Often, as you will know, many projects of that kind even produce some really impressive software, but almost none of that software and almost none of the educational background and theory and innovation that drives the project lives on very much longer after the project has finished. And it's my contention, and I think the contention of those that launched the technology enhanced learning phase of TLRP, that trying to think about the general in a more productive way, even as the specific projects are going on, might help us to lead to, to, to achieve this kind of accumulation of of findings that could actually make an impact. And we are doing that in various ways through commentaries. There will be a commentary released in a couple of months' time now on web t designing Web 2 for education and working papers and special editions of journals and so on. Now, I want to stress that I think this is a modest enterprise. I don't believe that an initiative of this kind with a modest number of projects however well intentions, is going to massively change the world. But I do think that it, it, there is much in educational research and in the leading edge of the way that computer science and artificial intelligence is assisting in that educational program that may be of um, importance for those of us working in universities and higher education institutions. I think there will be a time lag, and the difficulty with this kind of initiative is that it's almost, it's exceptionally unlikely that the outcome of a three-year research project, even one with a one and a half million pounds, is going to immediately make an impact in the way we, change, in the way we do our business on a day-to-day -day basis. I think we have to take a longer-term view, 
but just how much of a longer term we can afford to take is, of course, a, a difficult issue. We have a number of partners, the Higher Educational Academy and Bechter and so on. I should say that only a minority of the um, projects are specifically involved in higher education. But one special partner that I'd like to thank publicly is JISC, who have made um, not only material support, but made us realize that even those projects that are taking place historically for the teaching and learning research program that ostensibly had not very much to do with technology at all can be as a legacy of importance when we're thinking about how technology not just should be applied in higher education, but how it should be designed. So I think this issue of designing technologies for specific pedagogies is something that we probably need to think about as a community of higher education academics, and one that I don't think has occupied us, especially uh, in the last few years. Well, here is an unreadable slide of all the eight projects, but I was petrified that there would be a, a representative of one of the projects that I didn't happen to say anything about. So here is, uh, here is your project if you are secreted somewhere in the audience. Um, but just casting your eye down, you can see uh, semantic technologies. You can see interlife, which you could probably guess is something to do with second life. Um, I will say more about the learning design support environment and the one after that. We have the Phantom Project looking at haptic devices for training. Um, the training of dentists is a fantastically interesting project, but it makes me feel queasy whenever I read or hear them talk about what they do. Um, and I'm going to say something about the last two more specifically. So this is, a, if you like, a portfolio of projects. And the question is, whatever those projects are about, and obviously at this point you don't know what they're about, are there some more generalizable issues that we can bear in mind, or the projects can bear in mind as they're taking place, and which can allow us when the projects come to an end to say, we have some more generalizable lessons that could make an impact in HE and elsewhere. So here's the challenges. First of all, to develop, I, I don't know if there is a word cumulativity. It's a pretty ugly word, but I, I make it mean what I want it to mean. It's the accumulation of research findings. I think we're very bad at building on what exists. If you look at the proceedings of almost any conference that has the word education in the title, you find some fantastically interesting projects, no two of which have anything to do with each other. I'm exaggerating. And I think that is a real challenge for us and one of the reasons why it's so difficult to say, well, look, there are these, this group of projects that have taken place over N years and they seem to indicate that there is a way that we could improve the teaching and learning of whatever subject or maybe even more than one subject. Um, we have a mission to develop research capacity and uh, uh, equally to foster change through co-design. So all of the projects whose names you've seen but whose content at the moment for you is empty are committed to working alongside the people for whom the projects are being undertaken. So with teachers or with lecturers and, and so on. Um, now this next point, it seems like a throwaway point, but I think it's actually rather important. I don't, I, I think if you look, for example, at the proceedings of AI conferences, you find some really stunning examples of leading edge technologies that ought to be having some effect in, in our teaching and learning. And more or less, I think it's true to say they're having a very, very limited effect. So if I, I'm, I'm making this up as I go along, but if I could say to Denise, wouldn't it be great if not just Moodle was being employed at the OU, but in the, it, it's a situation crying out for some ways in which AI research ought to be able to be fed into that kind of situation so that the system is intelligent enough to know what individual students or sub-communities of students might want and might need. There's a very simple example of how I don't think we are capitalizing on what we would like, to, what we have achieved. And similarly, uh, I don't think it's, it's especially useful to do the, to take a kind of drunk under the lamppost um, 
scenario. Now you know that you know the drunk under the lamppost, the, the drunk guy looking over here, and the guy comes up to him and says, "What are you looking for?" He says, "Well, I've lost a five-pound note." And the guy said, "Well, did you lose it over here?" He said, "No, I lost it over there." He said, "Well, why are you looking over here?" He says, "Well, because there's no light over there." And I think that you know, just having fantastically interesting computational solutions to problems that are not state-of-the-art in pedagogic terms is equally unhelpful as the reverse situation. So trying to do something about combining computer science research with the state-of-the-art learning sciences research is something that I think the projects are trying to do. And that means that we have to build an interdisciplinary perspective, bringing in social sciences and technological sciences together. Um, you'll know, any of you who have tried to get funding for educational research that's on the edge of technology and education, it's extremely difficult. With honorable exceptions, and JISC is another is one of those, with honorable exceptions, it's extremely hard to get funding from the ESRC and to get them to pay for some computer science input. And it's relatively difficult to get funding from the EPSRC if you want to put a substantial amount of money into pedagogic initiatives at the same time. So uh, the, it's a very welcome development that they, this program, the tail phase of TLRP, is not just encouraging but insisting that ideally there will be real advances in both computer science and in the learning sciences. Well, here are the grand challenges of technology-enhanced learning as stated not by me but as uh, stated by those that were responsible some four years ago now for launching what became the tail phase of TLRP. And the buzzwords are personalization, inclusion, flexibility, and productivity. I say buzzwords because some of those words, like personalization, has become pretty much debased currency in the hands of some of our politicians. And it's not clear what it means. I mean, what does it mean? To personalize a technology? Well, so the technology knows what you want, but it also needs to know what it is somebody else thinks you need. That's what education is partly about. So this is a very complex question. And I've heard it argued with some force, actually, that personalization puts too much emphasis on the individual in any case. When the individual is part of a community, maybe we need a new word that is kind of community of practicization or something. So these words are pretty um, problematic. Flexibility. Well, we all love to use iPhones and we all like to be flexible and in theory it seems you can sit on the top of a bus learning um, mathematics just as well as you can sit in a classroom. Well, that's kind of true and uh, mobile technologies do make certain things possible that weren't possible before, but they also restrict the kind of thinking that I think has gone into many decades, hundreds of years of a more formal learning situation, none of which necessarily has to be thrown out uh, with the bathwater. So I think some of these ideas that drove the government's uh, um, thinking at the beginning of this century and lent their name to the tail phase of TLRP need to be analyzed a little bit more carefully. So here's what they're supposed to mean. Personalization is trying to exploit the responsive and adaptive capabilities of advanced digital technologies. And uh, this is the kind of mission that makes you say, well, that would be great, wouldn't it? I, I think we have a long way to go. And I'm, what I'm going to do now is in each of those cases, I'm going to give you just one tiny glimpse of the of one of the research projects that, in a sense, um, represents the buzzword. Now, I can't do anything more than simply float above the issue and to invite you not to think so much about the specificities of the project as I describe it, but to just ask yourself, how generalizable is that? Are there lessons about personalization in general that one might reasonably expect to emerge from a project dealing with the, this kind of issue. So here's the first one. I said in the abstract that I would say something about my own research. And this is a project it, that I'm the PI of. I should hasten to say that I was appointed director of TEL after 
the receipt of the grant for this project. Um, but this is looking at s secondary school pupils' understanding of mathematical generalization. And any of you in the audience who are teaching mathematics at the higher level will know that they can't, you cannot take for granted, even with undergraduates for whom mathematics is part of their uh, degree, you cannot take for granted that they understand what the whole notion of generalization is about. That's because it's an extremely com uh, complex idea. And what the um, MyGen project is, is trying to do is, first of all, assist students in recognizing and analyzing and expressing the structure of patterns. So here is a pattern. It seems that when you, I don't know, add two n odd numbers together, you always get an even number. So why is that? If you're 13 years old, it even it demands an explanation why you should want to know that it's true. If it seems true, if you take six examples, it obviously seems to be true. Why would you want to prove it in the first place? So thinking about those kinds of issues is, is a challenge for many students. And at the same time, you remember I said we should have not just educational challenges, but also computational challenges. Can we build an intelligent support system that will support not just the students, the huge literature in AI and trying to, uh, through user modeling and various other um, pathways to understand what the individual wants and much, much less, surprisingly actually, I think, of how we could support teachers um, in assisting their students. That's a fundamental problem. You, know, you have 30 students in a class as a teacher. You may have 200 students in a lecture. You may have however many you have in your tutorial group. And understand, so having support from a computational system that would assist you in giving the right kind of assistance to students, I think is a, is a far from well-explored uh, area of the literature. So here's what the MyGen project is trying to do. It's trying to build a micro-world for young students, 13, 14, 15 years old, to explore generalization. Am I going to explain the details of this picture? No, it's just a pretty picture to say to you, there's a micro-world, something to explore, some interesting um, uh, activities that you can do. And alongside this micro-world, we have an ambitious aim, which we may or may not succeed. I should say that I think one of the interesting things about the projects that were selected for funding by the ESRC and the EPSRC is that they're extremely edgy. Um, I think that I would consider the whole program a success if half of the projects achieved half of their objectives. And uh, certainly some of the computer science objectives that the projects have set themselves are extremely complex, uh, and the added complexity of having computer scientists and social scientists working together doesn't make life any easier, but it is a kind of challenge that I think we're trying to rise to. So here's the micro world, and at the same time, a, a system of personalized feedback during the process of modern, model analysis. Now here's an idea that rises above the specificity of this very dense five-line description, which is, it isn't that difficult to build an intelligent system for a, for a tutorial sequence. If I know seven things that I'm going to tell you, and I know roughly the order in which you need to know those things, and I have a simple way of assessing whether you've understood what I'm telling you or not, it isn't that difficult now to build an intelligent, quasi-intelligent system that will assist you and build an image of what the user needs and give the user a pathway through those seven ideas. But if you give the user an exploratory system, if it's not clear what at any instant the value of that particular exploration is, whether maybe even the blind alleys of the exploration are just as important as the so-called correct solutions, it may not even be clear what a correct solution is to a specific action. Then building an intelligent system is much more complex. And of course, there is a literature on this kind of issue, but it isn't anywhere near as developed as the low-hanging fruit of, let's say, how do you learn to do long division, um, which on the whole is a sequence of 
actions which doesn't really matter if you know why you're doing them or not as long as you do them in the right order. And the last thing, and here again I'd like you to consider whether there might be at the end of a project like this some lessons that might be more generalizable, is a collaborator that fosters and sustains an effective online learning community. Well, online learning communities are to a penny uh, now. Or at least online communities are to a penny. Online learning communities are less um, prevalent. And uh, giving intelligent support for the creation and sustaining of an online community is really something that is still in its infancy. Okay, let me go to inclusion. How am I doing for time, Robin? Um, Good, okay. So inclusion is pretty self-evident what it means, although I'd like to include in the idea of inclusion, not just inclusion in the sense of individuals who might otherwise be excluded or communities that might otherwise be excluded, but knowledge which might be excluded. I think one of the huge uh, potentials of digital technologies is that we can now tell, get, help people to learn things that were virtually unlearnable before. That, that learnability is something that is dependent on the tools that we have. We have huge power potentially in these tools and there are new things that we could teach and perhaps old things that we don't need to teach anymore. I'll leave that in the air just for, and I'll come back to it in the last minute of my talk. I'm probably going to have to go faster than I would like to go, but this is just a, um, a really interesting project on the theme of inclusion. Um, it's dealing with kids on the autis autistic spectrum, uh, specifically Asperger's syndrome, and has, this, has a really very ambitious set of uh, computer science, HCI, uh, visualization, uh, integration challenges. Um, I've tried to make bold the, the, the words gesture, gaze tracking, agent-based, context-sensitive interfaces, and so on. And you can see that this is a, um, an attempt to harness technology to try to get to the bottom of not just what Asperger's syndrome is, which is an interesting social scientific goal, but also trying to give those children some opportunities for interaction so that they come to understand better what emotional responses of themselves and others are all about. Here's a, a little boy who is following, the, the details don't really matter, but the, the interesting thing about Asperger's is that it's very difficult for them to understand that what other people do are based on their desires. So any, any ways in which the system can give the student an opportunity to interact and for the system to interact back and say, perhaps you need to look over there or perhaps you need to think about what so-and-so needs and so on is a, a very interesting problem. And it's a problem that is well understood in the social scientific literature, but bringing to bear computer science onto that problem is less well explored. So what are the research challenges of a, pro a project like that? Well, to take the second one first, there are even just, as the, as the researchers say, several of the components are currently at the prototype phase and their interoperability is not a given. That's an understatement, I think. But the first one is an interesting social scientific uh, challenge because autistic spectrum is a spectrum and we all live on that spectrum. And it ought to be the case, I think, that really forcing oneself to be more specific because one's building a com computational system, more specific about what the disorder is, which should also throw light on the emotional responses of us all and potentially of our students. So let's just, here's the, the, the rising above idea. Maybe some part of our in initiative in bringing digital technologies to bear into our universities and HE institutions could be about precisely the emotional responses and the, the non-cognitive aspects of education which are obviously so critical for individuals. Flexibility, well, um, I've already said that we, it's a buzzword that, that ought to be a very attractive idea and indeed it is a very attractive idea. Let me just uh, tell you 
about a, a lovely project that's now been going for nearly a year. Um, Mike Sharples in Nottingham and I in Scanlon in the Open University and various other colleagues. And the idea is to investigate issues that affect children's lives across different settings, including the classroom, home, discovery centers, and so on. And the idea is that they're acquiring data and making conjectures and trying to make headway into understanding, not just formal um, tasks from the classroom, but themselves, their environment, and their community. And as the researchers say, the technology will run on small touchscreen computers, integral cameras, data phones, keyboards, and so on. Now, this is a, an attractive idea, but I know that the researchers will take as seriously as I do just what a challenge it is and how, from a social science perspective, it may not all be quite as plain sailing as it seems. After all, if you take, if you, let's take the extreme example that you take uh, some ubiquitous and attractive social network software like, I don't know, Facebook. And you find a way, not that the researchers are trying to do this, but that's, that's a thought experiment. You find a way to integrate Facebook into the teaching of some arcane piece of science that the students need. What will immediately happen is the students who love Facebook when they're not in the lectures, the students who are looking at Facebook when you think they're supposed to be listening to you giving a lecture, will suddenly find reasons why Facebook for learning whatever it is, is not as attractive as it was. And I think this whole relationship between we would like to acquire students' own technologies and exploit them for our purposes, but as soon as we do that, we change um, the, the way that students feel about that technology. Um, so I think that's a challenge, and I know that um, the colleagues involved in that research know that it's a challenge, and that's what I mean by the mutual interactions on learning motivation. Uh, okay, let me move swiftly on to the final um, point, which is productivity. So I'm slightly squeamish about productivity. Um, I can see that we would like to be productive. I could see that it, it would be nice if technology made things cheaper. All the evidence seems to point to quite the reverse. Um, I think particularly all the evidence seems to suggest at all levels of education, including the workplace and HE, schools and primary schooling, all the evidence seems to point to the fact that the teacher becomes not just as critical, but even more critical than they were before the technology was introduced. And that the teacher needs help, not just computational help, to understand how to exploit that technology. So, as I say, I'm slightly uneasy about the notion of productivity because it would be nice to be more productive, but not at the expense of what we consider as educators good pedagogy. Um, nevertheless, there are researchers trying to work on productivity without compromise, and one of those is um, uh, Diana Lorillard and colleagues, a Learning Design Support Environment for Teachers and Lecturers. Hers is squarely in the field of higher education, but she has made some effort along with her colleagues, at least at the proposal stage, this project, this project hasn't even started yet, um, to make it clear that there ought to be spin-offs beyond the HE sector. And indeed, if you found ways for the HE sector to be more productive using technology, it would be hard not to come to some conclusions about productivity in general. So what uh, her team are trying to do is to develop an interactive environment to enable teachers to lead the discovery of innovative pedagogical design. Just think of the effort that has been made in learning sciences and computational sciences to produce systems where students can explore, where students can construct things for themselves, where students can come to criticize and critique what they're given and so on, student-centered learning. But how many can you think of that put the teacher in the same situation? I th I'd be surprised if anybody can think of more than a handful. And that's strange because if we, if, unless we're going to discard the teacher, heaven forbid, altogether, because heaven forbid at least because we will be out of jobs, but unless we're going to discard the role of the teacher, 
It's the teacher who can inspire the student to learn, to explore, to take responsibility for their learning. And how bizarre if we think that teachers are going to inspire students to take responsibility for their learning if we don't give teachers the responsibility for thinking about their own teaching and tools that enable them to do so. So what this project is trying to do is both of those and to try and find out what kinds of digital technologies will enable teachers to lead innovation and carry out successful design for technology enhanced learning. I don't have time to say very much about this, but here's a duality of, I rather like this, the duality of this project. To change the way software engineers think about tell support, and also to change the way educational theorists think about expressing learning theory. There's nothing better than to get educationists like me to stop waffling and have to think much more clearly about what it is they're trying to achieve and how they're trying to achieve it than trying to assist in the design of a computational system because computers are much less forgiving than audiences, human audiences. And I'm, I was going to say suffering, but also benefiting hugely in my own project, the MyGen project, from working alongside computer scientists who say things like, can you just tell us what it is you think the students would be learning then? And it's astonishing that I actually had, you know, it's taken me more or less a year of that project to be clear what the answer to that question is and how come nobody asked me that question before. So that's what interdisciplinarity is about when it works. Uh, I, I'm not saying our project makes it work yet, but it's one of the challenges. Okay, so grand challenges for TEL. I think there are 10 grand challenges for computer science. And your time is up. My time is up. Um, these four challenges were set by policymakers, not by researchers. And I think that they go some way towards setting the parameters of what grand challenges for technology enhanced learning might be. But let me just say one last thing for 30 seconds, two last things. One is I think that we have yet to uh, exploit the potential of the technology for students and teachers to construct with them for themselves. And that I don't really see how that fits easily into the four challenges we have already. And finally, the point I started with, and I said I'd come back to in the last 30 seconds. I've called it revision, but what I mean there is it's time, surely, to consider chucking some of the things that we so dearly think are crucial for students to understand and importing some things that were hitherto unlearnable. I think that's true in my own subject, which is mathematics, and I suggest that it might be true in your subject, whatever that is. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So. Sorry, I overran, Robin. Any grand questions for Richard? <laughs> uh, there's one just behind you. Frank Rennie, UJ. Um, that was a really stimulating talk, and you set a number of hairs running. I was particularly interested in your latter points about surely the, 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 what you're looking at, the reason that we can't do what you're saying you want to do is that we put the teacher or the tutor into little pigeonholes and little boxes. And we don't look at it in the whole context of the whole environment the student has. Um, a couple of examples from that would be um, Amazon, for example. You click on Amazon and it says, people who have bought this book also read this thing. Um, you, we can't do that in education for copyright laws that are arcane and, and, and beyond the pale. Um, we, we ask students to sign things in, tr in triplicate and put their signature on things because we have to have a written signature. And yet we happily have uh, complex agreements for PayPal and for buying things online and so forth that we don't import into education. So don't you think we actually write artificial barriers around what, what the tutor should be doing? And that's why the tutor is in the centre of ed education. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, at least that's one of the reasons. I think technology actually has a role to play in unlocking some of those cages. That wasn't, sorry, that wasn't your word, but, um, but again, I, it's hard to see that happening in the short term. I think that's a, that's a lot, what you're suggesting is a long-term project. Very interesting, and if I was to try and summarize it, I would say 
what's happening is we're trying to, or you're trying to, get computer systems to meld their way closer to the boundaries of, of individual learners, if you can see that particular point. But I think there's another grand challenge, which is that we need to try and change the characteristics of learners so that they become more productive learners in themselves, particularly in the view of the fact that we have limited teaching resources, we have an increasing number of students, somewhere there's going to be a breakdown in the system, we don't have enough teachers to deal with learners. So I'd be interested to know your views on the development of metacognitive skills in learners. In other words, the ability to set goals, to plan how to realize those goals, to monitor progress, to change the plans, to change the goals that need be. It seems to me that there are an awful lot of students coming into higher education who are incapable of doing that and who still either need to be spoon-fed or demand to be spoon-fed. And I think that there's a huge advance to be made in that particular area. If only we knew how to do it. Well, Mark, okay. I, I can only react as an amateur in that field. Uh, metacognition isn't a, a research field. And in fact, interestingly and rather lamentably, there aren't really any projects in the Tell portfolio about metacognition, which I, I completely agree with you is a crucial issue. I suppose my, as I say, amateur response is this problem is only tiny part to do with technology and hugely to do with culture. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, I, I would say that cultural change in terms of what it is that education is for, I'm talking now about formal education, a huge no amount of hours that every individual in the Western world puts into being formally educated. Um, somehow we have to find a way to rebalance what is taught from a list of content and topics into the kind of metacognitive issues that you raise. Now, so just here's a question. Um, it can't be that technology doesn't have a role there. It, it must be the case, especially as technology gets more flexible that, and, and flexible in the standard sense. It must be that, that we ought to be able to design ways to try to catalyze that change in culture. But I have no idea how to do it. And as far as I know, there are very few research projects internationally that are attacking that, which is weird, because as you say, it's probably the crucial thing that we all face. Okay, there's one last question. Uh, hi. Um, I wonder if you'd just like to comment on uh, an issue that arose in a conversation recently. Uh, a number of us were sitting around discussing precisely the same kind of issues we're discussing now. Um, and somebody said, wait a minute, nobody's looking at face-to-face. -face. Why do we require all the learning technologists and all the learning technology uh, to provide all sorts of wonderful things? And the default option is just left lying there. Uh, let me give you an example. One of the people I work with had an online resource for distance learners. She then went back to her classroom and said, I'm not going to tell you this stuff in class. You can have a look at it on the web, because it's there anyway. And in class, we'll turn the class into a tutorial, and the tutorial will be based on questions that you put on a discussion forum. So if you put a discussion forum question saying, I've looked at X, Y, and Z, I'm not clear about so-and-so, -so, that will form the agenda for the tutorial. That totally transformed her contact time. And I looked at this and I said, we've never done that. We've never said, the default option, which is contact time, is OK. We need to interrogate the technology use. So it was just a different perspective from my point of view. Well, um, this is a really good example. Remember when I was mentioning the way that DISC helped us to understand that even projects that ostensibly had nothing to do with technology could feed into future projects or even existing projects that did have something to do with technology. So there is, maybe you're aware, maybe not, forgive me if, I, if I'm wrong, but it could be that you're not aware of the huge literature in education that does look at ways in which tutors and teachers interact with their classes and tutorials. There really is a massive amount of, of uh, literature. Almost none of it has anything to do with technology, and in that situation, that's fine, I think. Now, what is really challenging 
And maybe th this is a kind of placeholder for a much more general challenge, which is to say, okay, we have this huge literature on educational research, largely unread by people who are education practitioners. But now we have the extra added ingredient of the potential, not the reality, but the potential of digital technologies. Can we use the digital technologies in their place to enhance that face-to-face -face interaction? And the answer might be, no, not really, not yet. We don't have intelligent enough technology, maybe. Or the answer may be, yes, judiciously used, the kind of thing that the, the teacher said to her students may be just the right thing to say in a particular way. Go and look on the web. Might develop the kind of metacognitive skills that Mark's talking about. I don't know. But, but I think that kind of issue is in, uh, in need of, of research. But I, as I say, perhaps it, it, uh, afterwards we can talk about the research that has been done in that. Professor Elizabeth Woodman from the University of East London's Smart Lab. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you all for your patience in the, the setup. I am, um, as I say in America, legally blind. So while I see very well um, to function in the world, um, hitting little tiny buttons is not what my lenses are tuned in for. So it really could take ages for me to do a simple, small thing. Big things are much easier. Um, so I'll just start. What I've done is prepared a, a video, which is exactly 35 minutes long, and I'll talk over it. And what it does is introduce what Smart Lab is, what our method is, how we evolved from the Open University BBC. And it was a fantastic introduction to have the previous talk there. A lot of what I'm going to address comes from our experience of working with the Open University for B, uh, BBC for eight years and then evolving through other formats until we're co collaborating closely again with BBC R&D now. So I'll explain that, um, show you some examples of some of our main projects, one of which will be dancing live this evening in the theater across campus with two of our colleagues with severe cerebral palsy and some other disabled dancers and some virtual dancers. So I hope you'll all come to that and I'll introduce that project briefly. But the main focus of my talk, which I called Building the arc is really about, um, basically in recent years, I've, I've begun to describe the building of the Smart Lab PhD program as building an arc. <laughs> it's, it's a space, as, as the last part of this presentation will show, where it is safe to explore, create, collaborate, take time off, have a family, have children, be disabled, work in teams, not work in teams, get feedback from many different people, and continue your studies, um, whether one to many to many or one to one in whatever format works and where the team will help you to create the technology tools to enable you to do whatever you need to do. Um, so that program has now been running our PhD program for 15 years. Our first graduate was from the Open University, um, linked to our BBC research there. We've now graduated 30 successful PhDs, all with a practical base to their work. Um, we'll just pause it for a second there, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, and we've got another current cohort of 35 students and a constant queue of people wanting to join the program. And I think it's because of our method, the way we work, and what we're trying to do with that practice-based PhD program. So that's where I'm going with this talk, and I hope that that's relevant to you. I thought it would be useful if I take you through the stages of what Smart Lab is, why we work in this mad way that's so hard to describe without the video, um, and introduce you to some of the key players, some of whom are across campus right now rehearsing as well. So that's the plan. I hope it makes sense. And I will just shout over top of this video. And I just need to know how to restart it again. Where's on this keyboard down here. Show me which keyboard you're using. OK, cool. I'll shout over top. And where's the volume in case I need to bring it down? OK, hopefully. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Yay.